and in the preaching of some of the later additions to the role of ministers, the repudiation of confessional theology is as marked as the lack of any traces of a broken heart's experience of the power of the cross. And what is the character of the prospective supply? Enough it is to make hopefulness difficult, that our students can not only endure to be taught by men who treat with disrespect the word of God, but are ready to applaud, applaud to the echo with almost one heart and voice the men by whom rationalism is most prominently represented. If the Lord should withhold the spirit of repentance, it cannot be difficult to forecast the future of our church. End of quote. It was Dr. John Kennedy who wrote these words in 1879. In the light of the grave, yes, shocking departures from the original standards of the Free Church, identified early by Dr. Kennedy and clearly exhibited in the years that followed, no one could be surprised at the steps next taken to relax stringency of subscription to the Westminster Confession. If, as a great many thought, the new, more evangelical way of looking at Calvinism was not fairly stated in the Confession, something would have to be done about the document. Something was done, and quite quickly too, first by eminent ministers speaking, and then by the subordinate courts. Approaches by these courts to the 1889 Assembly led to the appointment of a committee. Its business was to advise the Assembly of the best way to ease the consciences of the many who now disagreed with some statements of the Confession. But of course the committee must bear in mind that there must be no changing of, quote, the great doctrines of the Confession. This tongue-in-cheek language was to figure in the whole process then begun. The committee's report in 1890 recommended the framing of a declaratory act somewhat like the UP Act of 1879. Prior to the proposed act being read at the 1891 Assembly, overtures were presented asking the court to state plainly and unambiguously that it accepted the confession as it stood. The act was then read and proved to be just what faithful free churchmen had feared. A very informative background to the Declaratory Act, the text and a full explanation of it by the Reverend James Sinclair can be found in the church history and I recommend the reading of these portions. All that can be done on this occasion is to sum up the real purpose of the Act as opposed to its declared purpose. The professed purpose of a Declaratory Act is to declare or explain parts of the confession which are thought to be insufficiently clear. The real purpose of this one was first to relegate to the background of the church's thinking the fact that God's saving love is confined to and not universal. Two, to represent faith as an act which any sinner can perform of himself, to obscure men's involvement with Adam's sin and to suggest that men can be saved without the word of God. Three, to water down the doctrine of total depravity. Four, to undermine adherence to the principle of the national establishment of religion. And five, to allow for differences of opinion and doctrine and make the church decide what does or does not enter into the substance of the reformed faith. As the godly in the assembly listen to that fine <coughs> To that final part of the act, they might think that such a church as the Free Church now was could not be depended to uphold any doctrine which would give offence to the new Enlightenment. Despite the care that Rainey the Convener and others had taken to make the wording as innocent sounding as possible, the act was obviously intended to allow persons taking office to modify to their own liking statements of doctrine with which they disagreed. Using the Declaratory Act, they could now, to give one example, disregard the words, this is a quotation from the Confession, some men and angels, a definite number of them, are predestinated unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. In place of these scriptural truths, they could stress God's love to sinners of mankind, even to such as never heard of Christ. 
Having presented the draft of the Act, Dr. Rainey moved that it be sent down to the Presbyteries as an overture under the Barrier Act. Only by this method could it become a standing law of the Church. A motion against this by the Reverend Murda McCaskill of Dingwall gained only 66 votes. The limits of this paper now make it necessary to be very brief in telling what happened in the next two years. The 1892 Assembly was informed that most presbyteries had approved of the Act, although 23 did not. Dr. Rainey then moved that the Declaratory Act become an Act of the Free Church, and his motion defeated another seeking delay by 346 votes to 195. Great and unruly jubilation greeted the result. A few dissented, protested, and appealed to the next assembly to repeal the act, but the present fact was that the character of the church had radically changed. In the year that followed, it became clear that the main group of the act's opponents, known as the Constitutionalists, were not now in favor of leaving the church, whereas a number of students and elders were. Only one minister made known his purpose to leave if there was no repeal. This was Reverend Donald McFarlane of Kilmally. He was then in Kilmally. Assembly time came and the ten overtures seeking repeal were disregarded on Dr. Rainey's motion that they challenged the church's right to legislate as it had done. A dissent was signed by 21 ministers and the same number of elders against the large majority decision. That was all the length the objectors would go. But the Reverend Donald McFarlane went further. He went to the clerk's table, it's already been pointed out that we have it here, read a protest, <laughs> put it on the table, and after his action had been discussed, left the assembly. His protest that the church had by the Declaratory Act ceased to be the free church, and that he was bound by conscience and ordination vows to remove himself from it, was not received because it repudiated the authority of the highest court of the church. And that was exactly what Mr. McFarlane meant. The Cames congregation and that of his own at Razi supported Mr. McFarlane's action. So did the Reverend Donald MacDonald of Shieldig and a large number of elders and people in the Highland area. That part of the free church had all along opposed the backslidings. On the 28th of July, 1893, the separation was formalized the two ministers and Mr. Alexander McFarlane, a Razi elder, formed themselves into the Free Church Presbytery of Scotland in a meeting at Portree and agreed to prepare a statement that would explain the solemn step they had taken. They licensed one student and set trials for another. At the next meeting on the 14th of August, the deed of separation was adopted. It is hoped that the facts in this paper, condensed though they are, will show that it was imperative that the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland should be set up in 1893. The Lord has owned our continuance in various ways, and we should pray that by a great outpouring of his Spirit, he will bring it to pass that the relationship we bear to the Word of God and the Westminster Confession will become that of multitudes of our fellow countrymen. In large measure, they are the victims of the errors of the Declaratory Act, and only saving grace will recover them. That's my paper. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. McPherson. I uh, will now have a, a short interval of ten minutes, uh, and then proceed with the next matter. As British Rails would say, we are running a bit late, but unlike British Rail, we hope uh, to get on the rails again at a later stage. But we'll stop just now for 10 minutes, and uh, while we do do so, I might uh, just pass the remark that uh, uh, this book uh, is available outside. It's a book of, uh, called Minister and Men of the Free Presbyterian Church, uh, uh, which have been uh, sent round, and they are available out, uh, uh, at the table outside, and also any who wish uh, a, a tapes of uh, the proceedings to, 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 uh, this evening, uh, today, as you say, uh, can uh, sign for these at the same table. Ten minutes then. Thank you.